So one of the goals early on in this class was to think about telepresence technology and how it can be helping people, uh, for example, older people stay connected. And this group really took that, that idea and ran with it. And so I'm um, really excited to see what, what they did. Or walked with it. <laughs> or walked with they it. They ran with it, right? They walked with it. Kind of shuffled with it. Ooh. Okay. So today we're going to talk mostly about our goals and process and how we see this um, as a part of an uh, aging population ecosystem. So early on, early on in our process, we, we made this chart where we've got responsible design, discursive design, near future design, and far future design. And we kind of located ourselves in this mostly responsible, mostly near future so just to understand our goals with this project, we wanted to create something that could have some real, like, tangible improvement on society, but also you know, forward thinking and forward, we're not um, completely focused on it. And um, a lot of what we're doing was inspired by a trip that, two, two trips that we've taken to a nearby nursing home and also assisted living place called St. Elizabeth's, which is very nearby. Some of us in the room are extremely familiar with this place. And uh, one of the questions that we asked that incited really interesting discussion was the question of if, if having a robot in your home allowed you to stay at home longer by yourself, would you welcome it? We got some really interesting responses. Some of, one which, um, which, which was interesting is that yes, if it gets the job done. And this was from a, a woman who was like the most personable, the most affable out of the whole group. And you'd think that this would be the, the, one, the one girl out of the whole gang that would want to be with other people. But she was like, in an instant, like, independence is like really the most important thing to me. And that's what she thought. And so this was kind of a recurring theme that we found that independence was something that was really important to people as they age. Um, do you want to talk about this? Yeah, so um, so in comparison to walkers that exist, one of the key formal distinctions is that, um, so w walkers that exist now, um, like are, they have like a really, uh, a large footprint in the sense that they're really deep. So if I'm holding a walker, um, it, most of them are designed so that I sort of step into it. So then it's gotta be wide enough from the start of the handlebar to the, the front legs that I can actually step into it. Um, that presents a problem in a nursing home or assisted living facility because you have a lot of walkers. So um, when we talked to St. Eliz Elizabeth, they said that about 75% of the residents use a walker at least some of the time. So that's a lot of walkers and most people have their own. Um, presents a, a really big problem. How are you gonna store them when you have people congregating in social situations like at meal times, where are you gonna put all of them? In a lot of cases, you have to have people leaving them outside the, the smaller rooms or rooms with lots of furniture, which then means that they don't have walkers to get back and forth and they're gonna have to um, maybe have a, a increased risk of falling. Um, so we wanted to build something that would be more scalable, that would allow uh, more of a social use, so many people using them at once. Um, and uh, also another issue was that um, a lot of the reason that people use walkers in the first place is to prevent a fall. So a uh, typical walker can help prevent a fall just by physically supporting somebody um, or being there in case in case they start to fall and then supporting them in that case. But once somebody has fallen, um, it, it can't really do much to help them. And we've, we've read of cases or problems in um, assisted care, assisted living facilities where people would fall and um, not, not have a any way to alert somebody that they'd fallen and then would end up becoming injured and maybe having to stay there with an injury for a long time um, and then that recovery process becomes really hard so if we had a walker that was a little bit more intelligent and could provide some sort of assistance in the event that somebody fell then that might help um, mitigate the risk of falling and then so we are also you know so we're putting ourselves in this context of the nursing home and making these observations about real human needs and how they feel like their independence is really important. We're also looking at the existing technologies that we're trying to come in between. So we noticed 
these existing problems with the walkers, and we also notice these existing problems with telepresence robots, which is, you know, these things listed here. And so in our design process, we're trying to come up with a way to sort of accomplish an improvement of the walker and an improvement of the telepresence robot. The, the walker kind of needs to, needs to do more things that are going to be more helpful, and the telepresence robot kind of needs to feel more human and to augment the human experience rather than surrogate. Yeah, so something that we were really interested in um, building off of current telepresence robots is that we felt that there was kind of a wall between if I'm physically interacting with a telepresence robot, there's a wall there because primarily the telepresence robot is being controlled by somebody who's potentially really far away, and there's not much that I can do short of picking it up and carrying it around, which is not really um, a use case that it's designed for. So if if I have more control physically over that robot, like if I feel more like the owner rather than the person who's a million miles away, then I might be more willing to let this robot become a part of my life. I might be more willing to, for example, comply with my doctor's request that I use a walker, or I might feel more comfortable with having a robot in my space. So um, we're doing some, this is kind of, for me, part of where it gets really exciting, and we were talking with some people in the in this industry about sort of how these different tiers of care work, and I heard this really interesting uh, sort of like fact that each each like level of intensity of care is kind of like a twenty percent price decrease, and something that's kind of going through our head a lot of the time is like, wow, this seems like such an expensive thing to have. Like, who can actually afford this and keep it with them? A little bit of a little bit of math, and um, if it's just something that can keep you, if just the, the layer in between assisted living and living on your own, a conservative estimate of half that you know, take that twenty percent. If you took half of that, it would be up to it'd be worth a family. It would be worth seventeen thousand dollars to that family to like be able to keep that person independent. So this is kind of a, a really big validating step for us, where we're like, wow, there's some real potential in here, not only to like improve these technologies and to help someone stay independent for longer, but also it's like, it's something that, uh, that is, is practical. Um, so I just want to briefly d explain what these two things are. This is kind of our strategy for how the robot helps people. So there are these things called ADLs, Activities of Daily Living, and IADLs, Instrumental Activities of Daily Living. So ADLs are like the like need to have things. Like if you're going to be living independently, you need to be able to do these things for yourself. So it's like dressing, self feeding, toilet hygiene, things like that. And then IADL are like things that you need to have happen. But you know, if you have family that are nearby, they can help out with. They can help you out with this stuff, and you can you can get by for three days without managing your finances. For example, you can get around for a week without. Uh, uh, basic home maintenance. And so our strategy for how the how the robot works is kind of two behaviors. This communication tool behavior and this assistant behavior. So how the communication tool behavior works, and this is you know largely when it's in this orientation. That's also an assistant. Um, this is communication tool mode. So basically, the traditional telepresence robot paradigm is what we're imagining. And so, you know, th this provides a, a way, a means for you to exchange with care providers, you know, telepresence conferencing with the patient, and like, hey, how is your, how, how have you been doing with taking your medication? How often have you been going for a walk? And what's cool about that is, is since this robot knows where it is all the time, with smash, Slam, slam and everything. <laughs> <laughs> Did that on purpose. And it, it can actually track how much activity you've seen. So the, the doctor can ask, um, oh, have you been walking? And actually, and, you know, it's a little bit of a lie. He can actually know, too. And this screen can also be used for communicating complex data in, like, a more approachable way. And it can also, this thing can also be used to communicate with loved ones. Um, which can help them stay mentally active, can help them feel loved and connected, and it can also provide another contact point 
for a loved one to potentially catch something that's wrong. And if, and if the loved one feels like they have a tabs on the person, it's like, if they feel like, oh, well, every other day I can Skype in, and if I can't find him, I can even, you know, meander around the apartment and see if I can find him. That gives them an, enough assurance that they might not put that person in assisted living for like another year. And that is a huge, that's a huge deal right here. The other use cases, the other role that this serves is as an assistant. So there's, you know, some setup period where some guy, probably a care provider or a family member, takes this robot around. It runs its very cool program for you know, creating 3D space in its robot brain. And whoever sets it up gives it some more information that says, this is kitchen. I don't think these robots are fast enough to detect kitchens or to detect living rooms yet. So we have to have a human help doing that. But what that does is it enables this robot to know where these ADLs occur. So this is kind of a, something that we had suggested to us by uh, Dr. Bezdeen at Brown, who's a, he's been working in this industry for, for decades. And he was you know, really excited and shared with us that kind of the most compelling use case for this is to sort of carry people from ADL to ADL and and give them tips and helpful helpful things along the way. So it's like, all right, Robert, now that you're done using the bathroom, you know, stand up slowly as we, you know, go to the kitchen or something like that. Or if you're in the kitchen, the robot knows it's in the kitchen, and the robot says, Hey, I know you didn't ask me for this, but why don't you check that the stove is off? And that's the kind of a thing where that's enough to, you know, it's not enough to, to do everything for this person, but it's enough to maybe split the difference for a couple of years and provide another level of care that would otherwise, you'd have to go to something much more intense, like assisted living. And then in between these things, it's doing something which is a navigation assistant. So it, it's using its cameras and its knowledge of 3D space to decrease fall risk by warning people when a, when a ledge is coming some sort of follow risk is occurring. It's also, it's also, you know, a walker, so you can lean on it. And this will like, this will hold your weight. Currently, I'm not gonna jump up and down on it because we only have half of our bolts in right now. But what we did is we created a, this guy's hollow, and it's separated by, you know, in here. So we have electronics moving up in here, and there's a belt that goes up to here. Arduino chilling in here that <laughs> makes him go up and down like that. And um, so that that's kind of our strategy for the interaction of the robot. And now I'm going to ask that the engineers on our team can talk about the the. Um, uh, I'm going to break this a little bit because I think it's important for you to talk about how the engineering and how. How it works on a technical side. So this is the first model we built to test the mapping system. Um, we initially we are offered a iRobot, but that thing doesn't fit in our current design. So we rip it apart and uh, take the all the control parts. Um, as you can see, motherboard, motor shield, and uh, we also we use the depth camera to build in like a real time. Um, dot map, map system to see if there's any obstacles and uh, any like um, and like to identify where the these things at. And uh, this is our like system uh, schematics. Uh, we have a pilot and the computer um, on 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 the other side of this like machine. So basically the um, people from um, like maybe the the, re the users' relatives or friends can um, run this thing from the other side. And uh, the how we um, realize this is we use a graphical interface. Um, we use uh, like a web page, like web page to do the controlling for this stuff. And, uh, Okay, and uh, we're going to show you later. And uh, to control the dynamics 
um, including like turns, moving forward and backwards. And uh, we also have a video streaming um, thing, which uh, helps both the users and uh, um, the users, like um, friends or relatives, to communicate. And uh, how we um, realized the dynamics is like uh, we had an uh, embedded system in this, like as you can see in this cylinder. Um, it's run by, there's like a computer here. Um, it ra it's running in ROS, and uh, do you want to talk, talk about ROS really quick? Yeah, ROS is a uh, robot operating system. It's a general uh, operating system for the general uh, for the general robot. So we just use it, and uh, uh, we are building some uh, uh, some bridge uh, between the robot and the public network. So we uh, so we use the ROS bridge, which can bridge the public network and to the robot network. So uh, so anyone from the public network can uh, log on to our web server to uh, to visit the ro to visit this robot and can pilot this robot. So and uh, with ROS we can also do navigation and do some mapping work. Uh, and uh, uh, as we are using the TotalBot motherboard, uh, so we can uh, use most of the TotalBot packages to to do the navigation and the mapping work. Yeah. Yeah. Sweet. Yeah. So now I, I no, just I didn't finish it. Oh, you, oh, you got more. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> um, so um, we use the as we as I said, right, we use the embedded control board from um, iRobot and also depth camera from Asus to do the like um, the first thing is to do the mapping and the second thing is to, uh, the first thing is to do the dynamics and the second thing is to do the mapping. And uh, for the driving train um, design, like um, we. This is thing is like 30 pounds, so we didn't put all the load on the driving shaft. We have a like, um, distributed load design um, to reduce the um, like fatigue on the shaft. So, but that's our like it brings more problems so, since it needs like very precise like manufacturing, yeah. which we are not managed to do that, and so we cannot like run as we want today. I mean, supposedly you should like run in there and yeah. check it around. So the things um, we could do is we can make the motor spin from a website. Yeah. 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 That's. Yeah. yeah. And and we you can see that and we can also mm -hmm. move it with our hands, but we can't have the moving it physically from the website. Right. Uh, I just wanted to take a quick second to show you some of the different prototypes that we did. We had a, a very differentiated strategy for different prototypes. We did a lot of CAD prototypes, thinking about how is this going to transfer from, from telepresence mode to walker mode? What's that going to look like? How is it? This is some models that Barbara did. What does it look like to slide an iPad in and out? And what if there's a notch in here so that it very naturally scoots back, the screen does? This is what they look like next to each other. This was the mapping prototype. So this was just the first one that was able to make a map, which was a huge benchmark for us. I think we also have a video this thing can run, and we do the little control resist. You can turn left and right, back yeah. and forth. And then this was like, just to show you how far we've come formally, <laughs> this is how we envisioned it. Part of one of the first formal investigate. This kind of looks like chron chronicles, of, chronicles of Riddick creation. <laughs> And this is an example of us trying to figure out how the screen is going to work. So um, those are some of our prototypes. We also have, so Barbara did some amazing drawings. They're figuring out what if there's a button, how does that button look? This laser cutting lattice structure alternating where the break point is so that it's very sturdy and lightweight because weight was a huge issue for us. It was a huge effort for us. And then we also have prototyping through foam core like a, a orthographic dimension drawing. So we're experimenting with a lot of different um, prototyping methods. So our, our next steps for this, next steps meaning before Friday at 5 p.m. <laughs> Automating the lifting of the screen. 
Um, we have a gearbox that we're going to stick inside the void that is present inside here. Because the nice thing about this being hollow is that um, you can put mechanics in there. And in the future future version of this, what we're imagining is that there will there might be a gear here connected to a line that goes up here, and then just when it wants to lift up, it just interfaces with the same gear as the wheel, scoots forward, you know, like one foot, enough to lift it, and then scoots back to where it was. But for the purposes of this prototype, we're going to stick an Arduino in here. And then the other thing is, we just need a lot of time to screw things, and spray paint things, sand them again, wood filler, more spray paint, etc. We could hire a small army for a could do an internship program on this guy. Um, if so anybody wants to help pitch in tomorrow afternoon, <laughs> we'll be here. We can actually show the interface too. Okay. If you don't want to. You're gonna plug into this. Yeah. Sweet. So. So this is the pilot side. So we actually have uh, two options for the interface. The first is <laughs> we have a. Uh, a side-by-side -side <coughs> video chat and web interface. Do the, like... So... I think we're, it's a network problem uh, that we're having. But anyway, so... Um, in the web interface, this is a status indicator here. So the green circle indicates that it's connected to the server, and then the using the arrow keys, you can pilot the robot through this interface um, while there's a video call here. The nice thing about this version is that you actually don't have to pair the video call uh, with remotely piloting it. So, um, are you calling somebody? Yeah. It's just yeah. It's just like it keeps out. Okay. Um, the other option is that we actually have a web interface with an Im embedded browser-to-browser -browser video chat. Um, the trade-off with that is that we need to have a webcam connected to, like, we need to we need to have a webcam on here, which is a little bit complicated with the like arm movement. But both ways work, um, and both ways you use the arrow keys. Pilot it. Yeah. Is, it, is that green circle real, or is that just a? It's idea? yeah, it's real. When you like, it turns red when it's not connected. Um, so it's connected, but you just on a video. So, so oh, okay. if you hit arrow, so I'm actually. Now, what happens? This is actually the. It's going to two different places. So the web interface. This is the. It's connected to a server that's running on G Chung's laptop, but the video call is actually just like to this surface here. So two different places. So um, yeah. So this when it turns red, that means it's not connected. Oh. Cool. How convenient. Yeah, so. <laughs> it does work. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> it is able to tell you that it's not functioning. Because it's not functioning. It's so good. thank you guys for coming and listening, and especially to the people that have supported this project. Again, we'd love to hear your feedback. Can, can you say a few words again about what did you say worked and didn't work in terms of the controlling of the robot? So we need uh, a lot of, so, this guy is responsible for the location of one gear. Okay. This guy is responsible for the location of another gear. Okay. So this guy and this guy need to be very intimately hugging each other. I see. And staying extremely precisely. The tolerance is like a millimeter, uh, and we haven't locked that down yet. Uh, we, we've got this to like centimeterly accurate. Okay. You need it to be one millimeterly accurate. And, and so that's a huge. You're saying, but it's not all connected obstacle. as the as the walker. It can it can spin the. Whoa. Yeah. Problem so solved. Oh. It's just not engaging the gear because it's, it needs to be really close. Okay. Actually, it was engaging with the. Those wheels look really cool, by the way. Yeah. It's just like, you know, right now, this, instead of rotating the motor, it just moves that piece of plywood because this piece of. These all these things just all need to be connected in more points. Okay. Basically.
Okay. But for the driving system, like everything's working except the transmission part. Right. Yeah. Mechanical transmission. It cannot yeah. bring the wheel. To okay. All right. Sorry. So, so I think it's open to you guys now. Did it move? Did it move? So, <laughs> um, one thing I have a question about is I'm not entirely clear on when it's being used as a walker. Is there any power going to the wheels, or are you literally just pushing? Is the user just oh, pushing it along? Power, yeah. Ideally, like there should be a clutch. So when it transmit to worker mode, the clutch will like detach the transmission system, so you can you can run freely. Oh yeah. yeah, yeah. Okay. I mean, but I mean, like this thing is fairly heavy, and so like the reason that it would be hard to move this right now is because it's attached to the motor, and the motor has some resistance in it. Yeah. So it doesn't want to propel forward. Okay. So like ideally, that's right now for in terms of our demonstration purposes. We're just demonstrating it in autonomous telepresence cool. robot mode. Yeah. yeah. So okay. that you would not have that kind of like the the like dream demo for us is that this carts itself over to my bedside and says, Ryan, you've been in bed for three months. Let's go for a walk. <laughs> and then it goes down. I go for a walk with it. It tells me statuses. It gives, shows me a data visualization of how lazy I am. <laughs> reminds me on my way back to take my back pill and then and then drops me off at the bed and says, All right, now don't don't make me come back to remind you and then carts itself off to the next person. Meanwhile he's enjoying the te tequila in Sao Paulo <laughs> while I'm in Cranston. And, and I think one of the impulses was is that it's not just a robot and it's not just Skype. It's kind of a combination of somebody, you can really interact with somebody, so it's a state where it's, it becomes a telepresence robot, but then it also has a kind of um, a, a tool, and a piece of equipment to be able to kind of uh, act as a walker. And I think um, how that user scenario works with those two different states, is it, there was a lot of thought that went into that. Um, mm -hmm. so. I think as a, as a like, imagining myself as a user, I think the grip on the, Bars would be really helpful if they're, yeah. if maybe you I see in our rendering. Yeah. yeah. It had haptic feedback at one point too, right? We thought about haptic feedback, but some of the them, uh, some of the feedback we got is that basically adding extra stimulus to someone who's having a hard time getting around already just increases fall risk, mm -hmm. which is one of the reasons that we nixed the idea that you would conference with your doctor while walking, and they'd be like, "Wow, I'm so proud of you walking right now," and they'd just be like, "What was that? Oh, trip fall." <laughs> wow, should have you airbags. didn't save me any money, now I have to stay in a hospital. Thanks a lot, Telebusiness for about one year. So people can drive it remote, I guess that's, I'm still yeah, a little confused. Yeah, yeah. The interaction between the remote person and me, the person who wants to stay at home and be more independent, and that, like, is, is it always remotely controlled? So Can I just say I want no help from anyone and use it? You yeah. certainly could, but you would never invest in this if that was the case. Like, it won't remind, I, it can't be set up to remind me, like let's say oh, oh, yeah, someone yeah, yeah. remotely walks it from yeah, my so bedside to the bathroom and then it, now it knows. It doesn't need yeah. that remote person anymore. So there are those two, those two, I'm going to go back to the diagram that's the two modes. So there's, there are these two modes. This mode does not involve any internet connection, other person, doctor, loved one, anything, whatever. And then communication tool is, you know, it's only that interaction. It's we've essentially the beam robot. The, right? Yeah, and we've separated them deliberately because if, if they have the distraction of this while they're trying to accomplish tax, it increases the risk of them falling and getting hurt. It was also really important to us to have the idea of consent because we really like wanted this to feel like if I'm the person who's physically interacting with this, I own it. It's not owned by some other person. And I think that's the difference between this and um, a traditional telepresence robot. Like the beam is that I own this, I physically manipulate this, and if somebody wants to remotely control it, I have to say yes to that. So to answer your question, it does not need to be tethered to the, that's the, the setup period. You need someone to help it know where the kitchen is. But after it knows where the kitchen is, it doesn't require any outside outside person. But I think that it, it's a way more compelling use case for me. I think that you have a much better chance of 
prolonging someone's independence if it also serves as a mechanism to tie them to people that care about them and are providing them with care? I, I think that that's a yeah. really good point, and I think it's really valuable to con consider how that works. I think in terms of how you're presenting it right now, it's confusing to see how all that comes together. So I think there may be a presentation issue. But it's also a fairly complicated thing in how do you transition from something that's operating autonomously as a robot into something that's being controlled by a person who's not there. Yeah. And I think you've got a good start on that. I think definitely having, uh, having the person who's using the walker be able to accept or reject a, a, an interaction is really important. Um, and I think having the arm go up is one way to sort of signal it's going from one state to another state is also really valuable. Um, I would go a, another step further in terms of, you were sort of talking about being able to say that you owned this thing. You actually want to be careful that it doesn't own you as well. So in the, in the autonomous examples that you gave, um, it's too much telling the person, you, Ryan, get on the bed, do this, do that. And it's actually came across anyway as if it's owning you um, and bossing you around to some extent. So I think in that sense, making sure that it, it and this is a fine point considering you've spent, what, 14 weeks on this, um, but making sure that it actually participates with you and is your assistant as opposed to telling you what to do would be an important thing to build into this. Does that make sense? Yeah. Okay. I just have one more little language thing, um, which belies, I think, the, a lot of, the amount of research that you all did. But at one point, you referred to one of the people you spoke to as a girl. I would be very, very careful with that language, because what it makes it sound like, first of all, I don't know what it feels like to your other team members. Um, but if you're trying to do really strong research, you need to be very respectful of the people you're researching. I don't know if you remember. But anyway, be careful about your language, because it can alienate an audience or your team members or more importantly in this particular case in interviewing someone and and then being off put by your um, your cues okay. yeah. I, I wanted to say a few words I, I think I really still love the the overall look of it the design is really exciting to me um, the, when, it, when I saw one of the CAD designs I've told several of you this already that um, I saw it on the screen moving around. I'm like, wow, I can't wait to get old, right? Because it just, it just, it's very, it, it, I find it to be a very compelling thing to want to interact with. Um, I have similar questions about the, you know, s switching between modes, whether that, how to make that really feel right. And then actually there's the three different modes, right? There's the robot acting on its own behalf. There's me pushing the robot. And then there's someone else controlling the robot from, from a distance. And really making that work smoothly is, is I think, very challenging. Um, and I, I think you guys just did brilliant things in terms of taking apart a Roomba and stuffing it into a cylinder. That's just, <laughs> like, I would not have thought to go there, and, and it, it seems to have actually worked. I, I, I came and got a, a close look at it, and it's, it's very impressive. So nice, nice job. Yeah, I, I mean, just to kind of echo everything that's already been said. First of all, another really ambitious project. Um, a lot of really good research that we didn't even touch on everything that kind of went into the kind of, um, kind of getting to this, this point. I mean, there were many, many more drawings or many, many more models that were made um, really exploring the form. Um, so I think that that was all, all really great. Um, I think um, all you know, the issues that have been brought up are, are things that you guys have been considering throughout the design process. And it'll be interesting to kind of see um, how far you can take this between now and tomorrow, where <laughs> hopefully we'll have a, 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 a something that... Um, between naps. Between naps, yeah. Maybe you'll sleep and eat a little bit between then. but. Um, but yeah, I think uh, I think it has real potential, and I think um, you know, like like you guys have identified, I think you've identified three really good areas: the locomotion and dealing with that, the telepresence, how it kind of signals um, being autonomous or being a kind of uh, a piece of equipment, and then the interaction itself. And I think, um, yeah, I mean, I think you guys did a really nice job of kind of. of of trying to kind of at least begin to kind of bring all those pieces together. I think that this is one of the more comp complicated projects. So I think there was a there were higher hurdles. You guys also lost a team member kind of late in the process as well. So I think um, be, I'm really looking forward to kind of seeing where you guys take this between now and tomorrow, and hopefully we can get it running and kind of doing doing some of the things that it's designed to do. One other thing, just to kind of be aware of, and I'm sure you already are, is the racking issue. Um, 
you're you're only connecting this at one point or I guess two points, but really, I mean, you're asking this kind of bottom cylinder to do a lot structurally. Yeah. So just you know, making sure that that is a really robust connection so that it doesn't want to want to rack. Um, but I think you guys can probably address some of those those issues. So um, nice work. Um, good work to everybody. Um, I and I want to thank our guest critics. Um, thank you for. Um, like like we've mentioned before, this is really a, a more of an abbreviated critique. We would have liked to have done this a little bit longer, but there's some constraints with with the space. So the hope is is that tomorrow we'll be able to kind of um, have these out and have a little more of a conversation. I was going to propose I'm going to be here tomorrow afternoon anyways, and I was thinking that if anybody wanted to come by at say four o'clock and get a little bit more of a of a pregame critique and get, help get things set up, uh, we can get into a little more. Um, what's that? A free game critique, right? <laughs> you know what I meant, though, right? Um, we can uh, we can uh, we can get into this a little more because they really do deserve a little more um, consideration and conversation. I think. Um, am I leaving anything out? Probably, but it seems like it covered things. If if you, if everybody could get here at four, that would be great. So we could help set up the party and everything. Um, but here, here, yeah, and we're going to have food, I think, and. Um, Hopefully there won't be so many Engine 3. I once again apologize about the kind of logistics with Engine 3 and kind of some of the, um, the issues scheduling space and time. But um, all in all, I think you guys did a really excellent job this semester. And I think it was challenging because, I mean, we all come from very different backgrounds, I think. You know, there's engineers, there's designers, there are artists, there are computer scientists. Um, but I th I'm just really impressed. I think without exception, every, every group has something that kind of does what it's supposed to do. And I think uh, you guys navigated the technical challenges. You really immersed yourself in the conceptual questions. I think everybody has come up with, uh, with projects that are very thought provoking, which I think is ultimately uh, one of the most important things to come out of the class. So um, it's been fun. And I hope that we can continue to build robots and build things in the Brown Design Workshop and as part of HCRI. Um, and we'll be producing a video about the um, projects as well, which should be out within the next couple of weeks, I think. Um, we'll make sure that everybody gets, uh, gets a version of that. Um, make sure that you're updating your blog so you have all your documentation up to date. Probably, we'll probably do grades early next week, I think, um, um, if not sooner. Make sure that we have a copy of your presentation, which you can email to, to Michael and myself. Um, and I think that that's it. So nice semester, everyone. Good job. We decided to work with the problem of designing a telepresence robot that would work for St. Elizabeth's, which is an assisted care, assisted living facility and nursing home um, in Providence. And so we were thinking about how would we make the form of a telepresence robot integrate into someone's life there. Um, we thought about things like we want something that is going to be able, it's not gonna, it's gonna be scalable, so therefore if there are a lot of people who are using uh, a, a robot like this, then that that is there. They can be a lot of them in the space together. Um, and we thought about having something that really felt like the person who used it was the owner of it, uh, rather than some other remote person owning it and the person who's physically with it not really having much agency over it. And so we decided that we would work with the form of a walker and. Um, through using that sort of form, we also dealt with problems of maybe how to keep somebody living independently or at a lower level of care for longer. So we thought about maybe somebody having something like this in their home. The telepresence aspect of it would allow them to communicate with their loved ones and with their doctors potentially. The walker aspect of it will help them get around. Also, um, we've got, so it has the ability to flip up so that it can be stored more vertically so that it doesn't have such a wide footprint like a traditional walker has a really large footprint, so it's a more, it can be used better in social situations where many people have them. Um, and We're going to show you now. Yeah. <laughs> so it can actually be remotely piloted over the internet. We have a web interface for it, and so anyone who Just so you know, this is the first there. time we have ever seen it work. <laughs> <laughs> Where is it going?
I don't know, it's fine. Oh, the uh, the uh, it's um, that's cold feet. Uh, there's a all right, we have never even tested this before. <laughs> there's a 50% chance this will work, but this is like my Oh, he's trying. I feel like that's you doing that. <coughs> oh, he did that. Sure. <laughs> Wait. <Yeah>. Isaac Newton. <laughs> he just needs a little bit of help. <laughs> and that, but you know, imagine if he didn't. How magical that would be. <laughs> <laughs> He's very good at dropping. Uh, <laughs> oh yeah, so convert it the other way. Can you do that? If it's up, standing up, can you make it go down? I just did that. <laughs> just, okay. Can you guys say a few words about your own background? Because I think this is one of the more right. diverse of the group. And we have to also represent the people that couldn't make it here. So we have two teammates, Karthik and Barbara. Karthik is PhD robotics student. Yeah, that's right. And Barbara and I are both seniors in RISD industrial design. So we nerded it out on form. And then last night I redid the... Oh, that's why. This guy needs tight. Uh, do you guys want to talk about your background? Uh, I'm a Brown, I'm a junior at Brown. I study urban studies and computer science. Yeah, uh, I'm a second year PhD at Brown Robotics Lab. Uh, I'm a first year master's, master's student and uh, I did my undergrad in Wisconsin doing mechanical engineering. But right now I'm doing electrical engineering. <laughs> okay. Live robot debugging. Uh, Claudia, could you re-ask your most yeah, insightful I question? To explain to you why are you choosing the walker as your right. parameters for your So we were mutually inspired by two technologies that could be significantly improved for the use case of prolonging someone's independent life. So we noticed that the walker, um, we noticed that you know, a, a walker takes up a lot of space. People often own multiple walkers. Uh, um, and we noticed that the walkers weren't able to really prolong independence. People use walkers in and out of nursing homes, assisted living, all that. We also noticed the telepresence robot was operating in a very, um, a very, simple manner it was just kind of like Skype that happens to be on top of wheels so um, we knew that we needed to fit a bunch of computer stuff somewhere and so we thought that the best way to do that would be to keep it away from your body so we thought okay farthest away from here and then visually it's also not in your visual space uh, do you have the dowel Can I just, yeah. okay. so I think we haven't really explained why this moves up also. yeah 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 we haven't explained why this moves up so the most Important. The most important, you know, concept. Pretend like this is, you know, right side up. Um, the idea is that this seamlessly moves between a sort of autonomous telepresence robot. So it like would cart itself around, go to the kitchen when it wants to, and go to the um, bathroom when it wants to. Or if someone says like, "Help, I need some assistance," it would be able to follow. Or you know, a a loved a loved one or a care provider could come to the bedroom and be like, "Hey, Ryan, you're so lazy, you haven't moved for days. How about a walk?" And then, when I begrudgingly get out of bed and walk over to it, I'm like, "Fine, okay." It it transforms into walker mode, and this is that's why we installed this guy, this little sliding thing, because you know, future versions that's smooth. This, this screen moves away from you a bit, so it doesn't distract you and increase the risk of falling. And then this is the, this is the mode where I'm walking across and it says, hey Ryan, you just woke up, your vision might be blurry, there's a step in front of you, don't fall, and stuff like that. 
so these these two modes of the tall presence walker are separate because it's important for uh, for older adults to be able to focus on one thing at a time. We don't want to we don't want to increase the risk of them falling by like you know an, an initial idea that we had that we had that we had to toss was that your doctor would actually walk with you and you'd be like oh hey which for us is like that sounds pretty cool I want to go for a how's it going mom but um, that was something that we realized was actually very dangerous. So that was the thinking behind this. Uh, yeah, so not necessarily, but like the telepresence. Yeah, yeah. The 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 uh, the uh, the uh, ADL assisting assistant mode. That's sort of like pre-programmed by a care provider or a loved one, or if they have enough uh, independence, they can pre-program it. And then once it's set up and it knows where everything is, it doesn't actually need you to. We like the idea of having a physical difference between this is a mode where I'm pushing this around and operating it, and this is a mode where either somebody else is remotely piloting it or it's acting autonomously because we think that it's really important that people that are using it have a lot of control and know exactly what's going on and are able to separate this is when I'm in control, this is when I'm allowing somebody else to have control. Um, and then just like formally, we really liked the look of, of this as though it's sort of like leaning in and listening to you when you're interacting with it. So a lot of the things we are considering is that for this prototype, you're only able to make one and we can't make it super adjustable. So we were thinking about what size we wanted. We knew that sort of the crease of the wrist is ergonomically the most comfortable. So people can hold it here and it's like fairly, fairly comfortable. We put this void in here with a little piece of color because just visually, like as you astutely observed, this is like very visually thick and heavy. So we added the void with some color so that it would Invite the eye to you know come back up after it's been done. All right, so so what I'd like to do now is is basically thank this group and all the groups for their contributions, what they did, <laughs> and to give all of you a chance to, to interact more directly with the, the different groups if you're interested. There's still some snacks left. Um, thank you for coming. <laughs> we're gonna feed Ryan. All right, so thank you all for coming out. This is great.